Welcome everyone to this evening's Frank Islam Anthenaeum Symposia series. My name is Monica Parrish Trent and I am an instructional dean located here on the Germantown campus and it's an honor to welcome all of you. Before we begin this evening's talk, I have a few practical notes. We ask that you silence your cell phones and that you are not distracted by any screens so that others can enjoy this evening's presentation. If you're a student and you need a certificate of attendance, they will be available at the exits after the talk. And for faculty and staff who wish to receive the multicultural diversity training credit, you may register at the entrance table after the talk. There are two microphones in each of the aisles for you to ask questions at the conclusion of our talk. You'll be invited to come down a few moments before the talk concludes so I'd like you to begin thinking about your questions, students. Our distinguished guest this evening is Marita Golden. But before we begin our conversation with Marita Golden, we'd like to talk a little bit about the Frank Islam Anthenaeum Symposia. So I'd like to talk just a little bit about our faculty coordinators and just remind everyone, some of you have been here since 2011, since the series has evolved under the expert direction of Professor Joan Murray Nake, who has spearheaded the Anthenaeum since 2011. And since 2013, the Anthenaeum has been funded by our noted philanthropist, entrepreneur, and author, Frank Islam. The goal of the lecture series is to invite a diversity of perspectives to inspire meaningful conversation and critical thinking around our collective experiences. This semester symposia explore the concept of change from the changing demographics of our culture and country to this evening's intimate account of how a diagnosis of Alzheimer's can change the experience of a relationship. This semester, the Anthenaeum series is co-coordinated by two faculty members from the Germantown campus, Dr. Joanne Bagshaw, who is a professor of psychology, and Dr. Tiffany Banks, assistant professor of communication studies. Many of you, however, have been patrons and supporters of the Anthenaeum for the last six years and have seen the tremendous dedication and care Professor Joan Nake, who created and spearheaded the Outstanding Speaker Series since its inception in 2011, has devoted. I'd now like to invite Margaret Latimer, Vice President and Provost of the Germantown campus to offer a few remarks. Thank you, Dean Trent. Good evening. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this evening's Athenaeum Symposium. And before we welcome this evening's speaker, it is also my honor and pleasure to say thank you to the woman who has given shape and form to the Athenaeum for the past six years. Colleges and universities have long shared the responsibility in a democracy for giving voice to ideas. So Dr. Sanjay Rai, who is Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs, but in 2011 was the Germantown Campus Provost, he asked Professor Joan Nake, who was at that time serving as Interim Dean for Humanities here at Germantown, to create a lecture series. It's been said that great vision without great people is irrelevant. Dr. Rye knew that, and he knew that in Joan Nake, he had great. Those of you who know Professor Nake know that her energy, wisdom, knowledge, and passion intersect in the space that explores ideas that expand the wisdom and knowledge of her students and through the Athenaeum through the greater, to the greater community. And so the Athenaeum Symposium was born with the generous support of Mr. Frank Islam and Professor Joan Nake's indefatigable passion, and it has grown and thrived. On this stage, we have heard Lily Ledbetter tell her story, 
seen Shakespeare performed, welcomed ambassadors and statesmen, authors, the grandson of Mahatma Gandhi, and dance inspired by fighting in Fallujah. We have heard Beethoven performed and poets. We have listened to survivors and dreamers. Thank you, Joan. Hubert Humphrey said, freedom is hammered out on the anvil of discussion, dissent, and debate. Those words ring as true today as the day he spoke them. And the Athenaeum will continue to provide a forum for ideas, discussion, dissent, and debate. And as Joan has reminded us, to gain wisdom. After all, Athena, the namesake, was the goddess of wisdom. Professor Nake has accepted another challenge at the college. You thought she was going to rest in her laurels, didn't you? Another initiative that will grow and thrive just as the Athenaeum will under new leadership. Thank you. Joan, thank you for what you have created and nurtured, and know that as the baton has been passed, the great work will continue, inspired by both the roots and the wings that you have shaped. If you come up, we have a very small token of thanks for you. We wanted to give you the world, and so we have a small globe as a memory and a thanks for all that you did to create this Thank wonderful you. opportunity for all of us. And Thank know you, that Jane. it is in great hands going forward. Thank right. you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I, I would be remiss in not thanking all of those people who have helped make the Athenaeum uh, such a success, and Provost Margaret Latimer, who attended almost every one of the 68 speakers over the past six years, is clearly a person who contributed her support to the Athenaeum. I also want to thank MCTV and Daniel Stesky, who untirely, untiringly and professionally videotaped almost all of the 68 speakers. Uh, I'd also like to thank Nancy Nyland, who is here tonight, and William Chang, who played earlier, uh, for their wonderful playing of classical piano before our events. I'd like to thank my colleagues in the English and Reading Department, who put up with my obsession about the Athenaeum as I walked up and down the halls. And of course, I am grateful to Dean Monica Trent, Tiffany Banks, and Joanne Bagshaw for carrying on the torch and for having arranged for marvelous speakers and authors to attend this year. Such, such as tonight's speaker, Marita Golden, who will tell us about the wide circumference of love. Tonight, I definitely feel that I'm surrounded by the wide circumference of love. Thank you so much. Tonight, we are very fortunate to have Marita Golden here with us a writer who has distinguished herself as a master of the genres of fiction and nonfiction, Marita Golden has said, from the center of my experience as a black woman, I know that story speaks to everyone and is universal. Growing up in Washington, DC, Golden's gifts as a writer were recognized when she was a child and encouraged by her parents. Her mother told her when she was 12 that one day she was going to write a book. From poems and articles in the high school and college newspapers, Golden moved in her 20s to freelance writing for publications as diverse as Essence and the New York Times. But she longed to move beyond journalism and write stories that only she could imagine and tell. Marita Golden's marriage to a Nigerian and her subsequent experience living in Nigeria for four years formed the basis for her debut novel, the, my, the memoir, Migrations of the Heart, a novel I first became familiar with as an undergraduate major at George Mason University, where Professor Golden was one of my advisors. Because of its exploration of the issues of cultural identity and the impact of the social and political changes in the 1960s, Migrations of the Heart has gained legions of passionate fans and is one of several of Golden's books that have been adopted by colleges and universities and campuses around the world. The themes of the intersection of the personal and the political, the bonds of friendship among black women, and the stresses on and resilience of the black family are frequent themes in Golden's fiction and nonfiction. To date, 
Marita Golden is the author of 14 works of fiction and nonfiction. Her many awards include the Black Caucus of the American Library Association awarding her an honor award for Gumbo, an anthology of fiction by African American writers, which she edited with the late E. Lynn Harris, and the literary award for fiction for her novel, After. Her most recent book is The Wide Circumference of Love. In this work, she takes on the questions of, what do you do when your spouse of many years has Alzheimer's? What happens to your marriage, your family, your own sense of self as the disease robs you, your loved one, of what's his or hers? What she uncovered were both the hard numbers that will impact us all and the intuitive truths about what it means to love through this challenging disease. In the end, the novel is a meditation on love and an unflinching look at the ways in which identity, happiness, and the future are reforged in the wake of, si of a single diagnosis. Marita Golden has very graciously offered to sign copies of her book at the end of this talk, and there'll be a reception immediately following. And seven lucky winners will receive a copy of this book that they can also have autographed. Please join me in welcoming Marita Golden, a longtime friend of Montgomery College. We are honored to have her with us this evening. I'm really honored to be here, and I've visited other <laughs> campuses, so I'm beginning to feel like I'm home. Uh, I'm so glad to see young people in the audience tonight because even though we associate Alzheimer's disease with people over 50, with our grandmothers, our grandfathers, it's really a disease that affects all of us. And if you are a young person, you may have a grandmother, a grandfather who suffers with dementia or Alzheimer's. Your mother or father may at some point develop Alzheimer's or dementia. And you as a young person need to develop now the lifestyle, the diet, the mental attitudes that can give you the body and the mind that help you actually fight the onslaught of Alzheimer's and dementia. Uh, during the question and answer period, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, I've been asked how I came to write this story, and I was sort of called to write it, and it's actually possessed me for the past five going on six years. After I spent four years researching the book, I then spent another year writing an article, researching and writing an article for the Washington Post about why African Americans are so disproportionately affected by Alzheimer's. And I thought I was through, but now I'm working on an anthology, <laughs> collecting essays and meditations written by caregivers, family, and friends called Love in a Silent Storm, Unbroken Bonds, Faith and Healing in Alzheimer's and Dementia. So what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to actually read something that I've written about what spending this much time writing about Alzheimer's meant to me personally, emotionally. I'm going to talk about the writing process, the research, as well as the deeper spiritual lessons uh, that this journey and this assignment from God gave me. The first time I sat in a group of men and women diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, I felt fear. I have, as I write this, traveled so far from that emotion, that response, that I write the words without any shame. It wasn't anxiety or nervousness that had my heart beating a bit faster, although what I felt was surely related to the kind of uncertainty produced by those responses. No. I felt fear. That is shameless admission number one. The men and women whose average age was in the middle 70s were residents of the memory care unit 
in an assisted living residence where I was doing research for a novel about an African-American family dealing with the impact of Alzheimer's disease. I was sitting in on a late morning session with the residents, listening to their stories, remembrances, and memories, prompted by gentle questioning from a certified nursing assistant. The session was designed to stimulate memories, essentially, of who these men and women used to be. The question was, tell us about the work you used to do. The fear I felt was, I now know, like most fear, irrational, ego-driven, and largely based on hypothetical what-ifs. It seems that we humans are always performing and always expecting others to perform for us. So some of the fear I know was inspired by the expectation that this group of mostly calm and gentle, well-dressed seniors would do something, say something, be someone that my arsenal of responses and reactions had not prepared me to handle. There was also the expectation that I, in the midst of a group of people labeled as diminished and intellectually incapacitated, would do something, say something, be someone at odds with the vision of myself as capable and in control in most situations. Then there was the other fear, the one that haunted me as I spent hours amongst these people who had lived lives of career and material success that allowed them to be cared for in a residence that did not accept Medicare and cost $5,000 a month. The fear that was raw and chilling in the early days of my research, the fear that Alzheimer's would, as it had come for them, come for me. But perhaps the deepest and most awful fear was, the, was that these men and women were lacking, because of Alzheimer's, a core, an essence, that would allow me to touch them and to be touched by them, to hear and see them for who they had been, and more importantly, who they were now. I knew I could not write a novel about Alzheimer's if I could not imagine myself as living and breathing inside their skin. During the four years I spent researching the novel, I did not get over fear as much as I allowed the vibrant, life-giving wisdom and humanity of these men and women chip away and dismantle it. And that happened because I was willing to hear and then to listen. What I heard and listened to wove a connecting thread between me and the people that I was, quote, studying at first, and then came to recognize as my shadow, my echo, in ways that had nothing at all to do with Alzheimer's. From that day, I remember the tall, clean-shaven man who sat in the group, legs crossed, periodically shifting his baseball cap on his nearly bald head as he smiled with proud satisfaction and told us, I worked for the Treasury Department and kept our money safe. The description of the job sounds so elementary, so childlike, and yet isn't that what the Treasury Department does, keep our money safe? The plump, copper-colored woman whose cheeks were smeared with rouge and whose gray curls were topped by a felt hat told us that she'd been a teacher. In response to questioning, she could not recall what grade she taught or the name of her school. But I watched her eyes sparkle in the moments before she closed them tightly and for 15 minutes, twice recited a poem her students had to memorize. For most of human history, poems enable the passing of stories between generations. Think of the Iliad or Langston Hughes' I've Known Rivers. Poems capture moments and experiences in a new way and communicate one soul to another. Listening to a poem whose title was no longer remembered, watching the fervor with which it was recited, I knew how much that woman's students had meant to her and how, for her, teaching was more art than science. That poem was a fragmentary fragmentary memory of her whole life. And there was the agitated woman sitting beside me, who during breaks in the session responded to my smile with a stream of rambling, repetitive fragments about being a student at Hampton University. 
Her eyes were both ablaze with life and somehow shell-shocked as she repeated over and over that she lived on campus and had joined the AKA sorority. Clearly the sisterhood, the sense of mission, the bonds that are the glue inspiring loyalty among sorors gave as much meaning to that woman's life as she sat beside me as it had 40 or maybe 50 years earlier. That day I learned that Alzheimer's does not rob us of memories as much as it shifts them around in the house of our mind. Some get stored in the attic and are rarely touched. Others, once consigned to the basement, are retrieved and given a place of dominance and pride. As I read more about the disease, I came to understand that it is when one can no longer remember, recall, or even learn anything new as a result of the gradual failure of the brain to activate and spur the body to function, that the disease becomes fatal. The absence of memories kills us. We die without the ability to recall who we had been, who we are. What I wondered would I remember? What in the midst of encroaching death would stubbornly give me life? I should have expected the request. In fact, I would have been surprised if at some point it had not come. Still, when it came, my reflexive tendency to overthink and overplan and overworry immediately took me hostage. The director of the facility asked me to do a reading and discussion of my work with the residents. Musicians, artists, journalists, she told me, had been guest speakers as part of a program designed to keep the residents connected to the world outside of the facility as well as intellectually stimulated. I knew that I would say yes, and I did, without hesitation. Even as I wondered if the months I had spent embedded in the lives of the residents, sitting in on their exercises, eating lunch with them in the cafeteria, talking to the certified nursing assistants who cared for them, would not somehow be compromised if I shifted gears. But of course there was something more. Shameless admission number two. I agreed to do a reading, yet wondered what a reading would mean for me. How would my writer's ego be fed by an audience that might not comprehend everything I was saying? What if they asked a question I could not answer? Oddly, I never worried about that with other audiences. This phalanx of largely trivial concerns was continuing evidence of how far I still had to go before I was wedded to these men and women before I saw them as my brother, sister, from another mother, as people as I, who I did not have to strive to understand because although I still did not fully know it, I already understood them because I understood myself. A digressive note here about understanding oneself, free will and independence and control. Since completing the novel, I've read more and more about how, as humans, we live both burdened and fueled by the belief that free will, independence, and control are the engines of our existence. In reality, we are animals, activated and controlled mostly by brain synapses, hormones, and genes. Sex, hunger, ambition, creativity, love, fear. It may all be a bundle of urges that positions us in a grueling life position, lifelong position of subservience to the whims of our internal biology. But as I prepared for my reading, I wasn't aware of that. I still thought that the best plan was to have a plan. Even with an audience of people forced to improvise each moment, I had to have a plan. I had to know what to expect. I had to know what might happen. Sitting before the residents that afternoon, I had a plan. I'd scrapped my original plan, which was to read from one of my novels and then take questions. By now I knew that my audience's attention span was more hope than reality. That in fact, I had at best about 20 minutes to essentially engage and depart and that rather than a sumptuous several course meal, I would make my offering in the equivalent of appetizers. 
I took a deep breath, one I hope no one could hear, and began by saying, I'm a writer and I grew up here in Washington, D.C. Writing has taken me all over the world. Then, rather than talk about my writing process and the subjects I chose, I shared how satisfying, wondrous, and wonderful it had been to have been given a gift that I honored and that literally became the vehicle for my discovery of so many other countries and people. I shared the experience of traveling to Jamaica to write a travel article and sitting on the beaches of Negril, serving as an official writer representing the U.S. in Turkey on a cultural visit to that country, of attending a writer's conference in London. The name of each city or country inspired someone in the audience to call out, I've been there. That was where we had our honeymoon. I went there for vacation. Memory and memories inspired residents to eagerly raise their hands seeking my recognition or simply to stand up and claim their storytelling space. What they shared were mostly heartfelt fragments of the joy of discovering a new land, a new people, and in the process, a new self. Now I sat back and listened, for listening and observing, hearing and seeing are the foundation of writing. Words only get on the page because I've listened to my heart or someone else's, and because imagination introduces me like faith to the power and reality of the unseen and the unknown. So allowing the residents to tell me their stories of the borders they had crossed was part of my continuing education. I thought I had come to tell them stories, but they forge an environment where we tell stories to one another. And so this reading was no different than any other. And then a resident recalled visiting Paris and blushed as she said, I was there in April with someone I loved. The room shuddered with appreciative laughter. There's much that those with Alzheimer's forget, but there is so much more that they remember. Love, desire, friendship, hope, dreams. I was no longer steering our craft and took another deep breath, this time one that signaled my surrender to go wherever we were headed. A frayed but beautiful tapestry was woven in the next few minutes. From silence, I did not rush to fill. And more fragments, rough-hewn jewels of people and places tossed into our midst. Then I reached for the book I had brought, my novel, Long Distance Life, about 60 years in the life of a family headed by a woman who migrates from Spring Hope, North Carolina, to Washington, D.C. in the 1930s as part of the great migration of African Americans from the South. The book was inspired by my mother's life, yet was vastly, a vastly different story. I'd chosen a paragraph to read, and in the quiet moments after the last word, the woman who had been in Paris with someone she loved stood up and pointed to me in what I initially thought was an accusatory stance and shouted, I know that woman. Those are the words that every writer longs to hear from a listener or a reader. I know that story. I know that woman, that man, that child. And we understand that then we've done our job. For what is known is known literally or spiritually or metaphorically, and sometimes all three. And that is what the woman whose name I later learned was Gladys meant. She knew the character in the novel and would in some sense take her with her when she left the small den where we sat. When Gladys announced, I know that woman, I felt in a long awaited moment of anointing that I finally knew her and the other women and men in the room with us. I began to feel that I could write this story. So now I knew I could create and imagine this story, but how would I actually do it? What would that mean, look 
often feel like for me and my characters. Although I consider the wide circumference of love largely a story of how married love and self-care are transformed by a wrenching crisis, it is grounded in the experience of one man, Gregory Tate, experiencing and living with Alzheimer's disease. The novel opens on the day that Gregory's wife, Diane, takes him to live in a memory care unit because he's been diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. It is the story of their 35-year marriage, their prodigal son, and dutiful daughter. I relied on several experts who read various drafts and helped me accurately portray the disease and how it manifested in the body of mind and mind of those with it, as well as its impact on family members, friends, and caregivers. The experts included the wife of a resident of the memory care unit I spent time at, a social worker on staff at the center, as well as a senior health consultant who helped families caring for those with dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Although often the actions of those with Alzheimer's and others dementias appear crazy, these individuals have not lost their minds. The writing challenge was to dramatize both the strangeness of actions induced by the diminishment of cognitive abilities and simultaneously capture the ways that what these individuals still possess bound them to us. After reading an early draft in which I was attempting to write from the point of Gregory, point of view of Gregory, the staff social worker informed me gently that I still had work to do. Remember, she said, when writing about a person with this disease, nothing that you can imagine is off limits, no matter how odd, incongruous, or inexplicable. My descriptions of Gregory, she told me, were too safe and lack the edge and tension built into the experience of Alzheimer's, the kind of edge and tension that for a long time I feared and that had once created a wall between me and the residents. She then told me about the resident who'd been a farmer and who often urinated in the potted plants in the hallway because he imagined himself watering his crops and the retired fireman who each time he heard a loud noise thought it was a fire alarm and banged on residents' doors trying to evacuate them from the building. Ultimately, I wrote a scene that captured Gregory's vulnerability, his fear as well as all his all too natural and recognizable yearning to feel a sense of control it is a scene early in his acclamation to living in the residence. It is midnight, and he's walking the halls naked. Naked because he's not only stripped of clothing, but also of inhibition and the self he once knew, the self he once was. He's naked walking the halls, fleeing he knows not what, but searching for a way out of this place back to himself. He wants to go home, and home is who he used to be. In the midst of a new scuffle with a nursing assistant who wants to guide him back to his room, another resident, a woman who has fallen in love with him, opens her door and offers a sheet to cover his body. As anyone in love would do, she offers him protection. The writing of that scene was possible because I mined my own generalized, ever-present vulnerabilities and used them literally as a springboard into the experience of a 69-year-old former architect with Alzheimer's, a man who was father, husband, friend, brother, son, builder, and who remained all those things in the midst of the most massive upheaval he had ever known. How did I find myself in this place? No one in my family had Alzheimer's, and it is a topic that I previously had little interest in. Yet writing a novel about Alzheimer's was as understandable 
as other topics I'd explored in fiction, among them the death of a child and the work and commitment of civil rights activists. I'd known very little about either of those subjects before the novels I wrote, inspired by them, plunged me into a world of imagination that possessed me in each case for several years. I'm drawn to write about what I don't know. And when I write about, in theory, what I know, I still write to discover what I don't. There's a word for that, inspiration. But for me, a more precise designation is that I've been called. Being called means finding answers as well as being swept away by a tidal wave of questions. Questions for my characters and questions for me. Fiction creates imagined lives and invades my own. Watching families wrestle and live with the burdens, challenges, and sometimes gifts of Alzheimer's disease flooded me with questions. Who would care for me? What kind of caregiver would I be? These are not questions answered easily, or only once. And like many questions, they have more than one answer. I set out to write not an Alzheimer's story, but a love story, and I did. I now know what the individuals who opened their lives to me know, that love, the kind that can withstand the onslaught of this disease and even blossom in its harsh, glaring light, is stubborn, persistent, resilient, impatient, sometimes confused, and never walks away. Thank you. Um, so I think I'm, I'm just going to read a little s scene from the book, and then we can open it for questions. Um, Because much of the, I think I'll read this one. Um, much of the book is a story of, is actually Diane's story of her journey through the experience of Alzheimer's with her husband. She's a family court judge in Washington, D.C. Uh, their daughter is also an architect. And their son has been kind of distant from the family for many years. And his father's illness brings him back. But a lot of the story is about Diane's journey into acceptance and then figuring out how to both continue to love her husband, remain loyal to him even as she creates and shapes a new life. And many of the people that were very important to my research urged me to write that kind of book because so many caregivers for many, many reasons have a lot of difficulty doing that. Um, caring for the loved one and also caring for themselves. Um, honoring the life that the person with Alzheimer's has and creating a life for themselves. Um, this is actually a scene um, where it kind of illustrates the kind of pressure that caregivers can find themselves under. And this is before Gregory has been taken to the memory care unit. This is after he's been diagnosed. As the months passed, Diane discovered new forms of agitation as new types of bewildering, nonsensical actions committed by Gregory crept into their lives. One night, one of her dress pumps went missing. An empty hanger bore no trace of a sheer silk white blouse. Sean's graduation photo was gone from its conspicuous space on the mantel above the fireplace. Her favorite umbrella, an autographed copy of Song of Solomon that she stood in line for half an hour for Toni Morrison to sign, all missing. For only a fleeting moment did she suspect Cecilia, 
that is the, the woman who comes in to take care of Gregory. Looking in the most unlikely places, she found her blouse stuffed behind the dryer. The photograph of them with Sean beneath the sofa cushion. Song of Solomon protruding from a plastic bag of trash, grease stained, and half the pages torn out. Now, she couldn't find the topaz and silver necklace and matching earrings she'd bought in New Mexico. All weekend, she'd searched the house, her fury rising. Gregory, I don't have much anymore, so little. Why can't you leave me at least some things that I cherish? Feverish with paranoia, she was convinced the actions were not random. Gregory's mind, she was sure, was brimming with malevolence. Stealing like this took cunning, planning, forethought. Diane stood before her husband, herself a kind of wreckage. She'd not washed in two days, brushed her teeth or changed clothes all weekend. All she wanted was to find the jewelry. All she wanted in the midst of this was to hold on to one little thing. Even it was material, tied to vanity and pride. It was her little thing, and he had stolen it. Just tell me where you put them. I won't be angry, Gregory. This isn't a game. The necklace and earrings, where are they? Gregory stood like a shabby edifice, unmoved in a winter sweater and corduroy pants he'd somehow found, although it was August and the house was sweltering because the air conditioning was faulty. His answer was to lope away from her nonchalantly, another thing she'd come to hate, casting one last look at her that promised he would never reveal what she wanted so desperately to know. Talking to Gregory like this set her on edge, made her hypersensitive. There is no past, no future, only now, this eternal moment. Now, lived in the extreme, a neon present tense, each word whether from him or her, a possible precipice. She knew not to touch him from behind, because if she did, the inability to see her, to prepare a response, often set Gregory howling and running from her. But she grabbed his arm anyway, shouting, what did you do with them? Pulling out of her grasp, Gregory clamped his hands over his ears and stomped in circles around the dining room table. I didn't do it, I didn't do it, he said. Bow, head bowed forward, hands squeezing his ears. You did, and you know it. No, no. Trailing him around the table, Diane heard her voice, careening, mad. You did. You know you did. The doorbell startled them, and she thought it must be the air conditioning repairman. But when she opened the door and saw Lauren instead, Diane covered her mouth with her hands and reached for her, holding her so tightly, Lauren nearly clawed her way out of her mother's arms. They stood in the portal while Gregory raged in the living room. No, no, it wasn't me. So I think we can take some questions. Um, we can th any question about writing this book, writing in general, uh, the article I did for the Washington Post, whatever. So I'll get us started. Um, my father-in-law, who was a community college uh, counseling faculty member for over 30 years in the BCCS, had early onset uh, Alzheimer's. We think it was before he was 60 that he was diagnosed, and he spent a lot of time trying to hide the symptoms. You want to continue to function at work. You don't want people in your church to notice. You don't want your family to be worried. And as it became progressively worse and he had moments of sanity, he would talk to my husband and he would constantly say, you know, make sure my dignity is intact. It was so important for him. And I don't know if that was a gene thing or if that was a black male thing, but it was so important for him to make sure that his dignity was intact. And I think he retired because of that early. He was so afraid. And so I wonder if that's something that you saw in some of the um, observations that you made, some of the people that you spoke to, is that 
a way that they mm -hmm. try to control a disease mm -hmm. that they have no control over. Yeah, well, that's a very important word, dignity. Uh, and I, I know that sometimes you'll take a person to the doctor and who has dementia or Alzheimer's, and the doctor will talk to you about them as though they're not in the room. And one of the first things I learned from the people I was, the specialists, is that the person with Alzheimer's needs to be treated with respect and, and dignity. And people really do fear uh, the loss of, of dignity. But I want to address a couple of things that you mentioned in your, in, in your story. Um, it's really important, even for, for the children of people with Alzheimer's or family members or friends, to, to as much as possible make it safe for them to say the Alzheimer's word. Because the longer you delay with getting people to the neurologist, it has so many implications. Um, there are drugs that will that will delay the, the seriousness of the onset. And the more you delay getting a diagnosis, you can go in and by the time you see the doctor, the medications don't work. Also because Alzheimer's is such a massively invasive disease that affects the finances of the family in a serious way, that asks so much of the family in terms of emotional support and planning for the future, planning for the possible death of the person, it's really important to, to confront this early so that people in the family can have a chance to get everything in place, to, get the, to wrap their head around the, what is happening, which takes a minute, and then to start preparing for what could be a decade of living with a person who has this disease. So one of the things that particularly happens often in the African American community is that people wait too late uh, to take a loved one to the doctor, or they don't recognize the symptoms as dementia or Alzheimer's, they think it's just getting old. And the kind of symptoms that are manifested with Alzheimer's are not just getting old. I mean, it's not a normal thing to develop Alzheimer's. Even though it's predicted that uh, by 2050, half of all people 80, who are 80 years old or older will have dementia or Alzheimer's, which I think is as much a result of lifestyle and diet and the poisonous atmosphere that we have as the genetic causes for Alzheimer's. So I think it's really important to, to if you're the daughter of someone, if it, to, to, help, to help them find, feel safe to say the word. Because I know there's a lot of resistance, but the longer you wait, there's nothing good that comes from that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. to visit what they call a type A continuing care community where they have, the, a couple can move in and have an apartment and then they have a separate floor if that person should ever um, get some type of dementia like Alzheimer's. I and never visited but I, I heard about those. Okay, well places. my question is, now that I've read Wide Circumference, at the time I visited places like this, I always thought wouldn't that be wonderful? The wife stays in the apartment or the husband as the case may be and they can still get together, even if one person needs full-time care on that floor, they can still get together for lunch and dinner and still maintain a marriage or a relationship. But now, having read the book, I'm wondering, it's almost as if that both Gregory and Diane were allowed to be free to have a new life because they weren't living together. I wonder if just being in that proximity would have made any difference. You see what I mean? He wouldn't have had the freedom to meet Wallace, mm -hmm. and she wouldn't have had the freedom to have a life with Alan and be free, um, you know, in her own environment. Well, I think that I'm not going <laughs> to make a prescription. I think that what what ultimate decision families make and spouses make 
is very, very individual. Um, it's dictated by financial resources, by temperament, by a, and by the physical health or ill health of the person beyond just you know having Alzheimer's. So I think it's a very, very individual choice. Um, I, I just think it's, it's individual. But I do know, for example, in the residents uh, that I studied, there were couples living together. But in that case, both of them had dementia or Alzheimer's. It, it wasn't like one didn't. But, but I think that for some people, depending on the nature of their bond with one another, and I think that that could be a viable response. So I think that it depends, it's very individual. One more question, mm -hmm. and I'll sit down, mm -hmm. give some others a chance. Oh, closer? Well. <laughs> okay. Um, I wanted, to, I just finished reading White Circumference today, and I must say I'm still a little bit unsettled about the attitude toward marriage. I don't know quite what to mm -hmm. make of it. Mm -hmm. um, there seems to be an ambivalence toward marriage. In, in what she's talking about is the fact that in the novel, um, and this is a, you know, might as well, this is, this is a spoiler to some extent, but you're going to read the novel or you're not going to read the novel, is that in the novel, um, Gregory develops a relationship with a woman in the residential facility where he lives, and um, Diane develops a relationship with another man. And as I was doing my research, I talked to many spouses and I did a lot of reading about this. And spouses come to different determinations about what they're going to do with their life. And it's not unusual for people in these facilities to become involved sexually and emotionally with new people. Um, and I, I got an email from a woman who was extremely upset, um, well, about this same thing. And she, she was, I think, coming from a, a biblical type of judgment and I thanked her very much for her her email and I didn't say that in the Bible everything under the sun happens okay people do all sorts of things in the Bible so I think that um, all I'm gonna say is that my research talking to many spouses and families and situations revealed and revealed that people find many different ways to maintain wholeness and health. So my question was um, in relation to just your writing process. Mm -hmm. um, and my question to you was, uh, did you choose Gregory's profession as an architect and essentially building structures and, you know, um, edifices to serve as a contrast to the disintegration that Alzheimer's causes in terms of the brain and its memory functions, or was that just a coincidence? It was a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, when, when we're writing, there are many things that by the time we finished writing seem organically built into the story that there was absolutely no other choice you could have made. Um, I made him an architect because I wanted a profession, I wanted him to have a profession I had never written about. That's all. I mean, he could have been a doctor and there could have been metaphorical symbolism around being a doctor and, you know, losing his health. But I think you're right. And in the book, uh, he's an architect who has, whose fingerprint is all over sort of Washington, D.C. And as the city is gentrifying and becoming this new place, he doesn't recognize it anymore. And so there's a, there's a kind of a tension between, as you say, the architecture, he was an architect, the architecture of his life crumbling as a city that he had helped, you know, in part, you know, build is, is rising. So uh, it was a coincidence, but one of those wonderful coincidences, and very often, the, many of the deepest, most powerful things that happen in a story come from just writing and writing and writing. And you, like the title, for example, which I love, 
came to me one day. Uh, I was writing about Diane. I was near the end and what all of this had meant for her and her family. And I, I wrote the sentence, the wide circumference. It just came to me. It, but it came organically out of several years of living and breathing the story. Great question. Excellent. Thank mm -hmm. you. So I'm a little interested in the um, recommendations you teased about around environmental um, exposures and diet that the young people in the audience might take advantage of mm -hmm. some of the knowledge that you've built in doing the research for this book. Well, first let's talk about um, what Alzheimer's is. Alzheimer's is a form of dementia. It is the most common dementia of dementia, there's, there's like, you can get, you can develop dementia if you have a stroke, if you have a concussion. Um, people with Alzheimer's gradually not just forget things, but they, their, their memory is impaired, they forget what use, for example, what is the, what is, what is a key, it's not where are my keys, it's what is a key for. It's not where's my phone, what is that? And so that over time, with Alzheimer's, the brain stops telling the body, I'm hungry, I want to walk, I need to go to the bathroom. And over time, because the brain stops telling the body how to function, the body develops an infection, and many people die of pneumonia, and, and basically just shuts down. So the, the brain simply, the, the simplest way to do it is forgets to tell the body what to do and you simply diminish, literally and figuratively. People with dementia um, have memory problems and cognitive, but they can read a book and then stand up and not know who their daughter is. Okay, so dementia, there are different types of dementia. Um, now, Alzheimer's, there's so much that's known, but there's a lot that's not known. Um, we know that there's a gene that causes Alzheimer's. Um, in the African American community, that gene gives African Americans a greater propensity for developing Alzheimer's, even though we don't know why. Um, in the African American community, the fact that there is more obesity, high cholesterol, diabetes, all these vascular diseases, over time kill the brain in addition to if you, have in your, if you have the gene in your family. So that, now in answer to your question, one of the most exciting things that researchers are discovering is that eating whole, healthy food, having a lifestyle that is active, and a, a, a lifestyle in which you are deeply connected to satisfying relationships with people and in which you actively handle stress very well can make a huge difference. They've done studies with young people, say, in their 30s who had everything, diabetes, high cholesterol, all those things. And if they developed a really good lifestyle, they had very little Alzheimer's when they got into their 60s and 70s. So even if you have Alzheimer's in your family, it doesn't mean that you're going to develop Alzheimer's. And very interestingly, when I was doing the research, I asked um, some of the researchers, would you recommend that someone take a test to see if they have a genetic predisposition? They said, no, no, because the test is not foolproof. Secondly, it may affect your car insurance, your life insurance. That is, everything's on the computer these days. Uh, nothing is secret. And so that they recommended simply living the healthiest life that you can live. So that's why I say that young people need to be thinking about it. I mean, my mother died at the age of 63 of a stroke. It was her second stroke. She'd had one when I was 12. She recovered. But she didn't change her lifestyle and eating habits because back in those days nobody exercised. You know, in the '60s no, we weren't exercising and jogging. You know, um, and so she suffered from being overweight and not handling stress well. Well, I looked at my mother, and I said, "I'm not going down like that." So in my 20s, I started yoga, walking, 
vegetarian, everything you could think of. And so now, I'm not gonna tell you my age, but I'm 10 years younger on the, you know, when they test you than, than my age. So I think that um, that's a very exciting thing that's being discovered that, and that's why I really do think that when you predict that half of the people who are 80 by 2050 will have Alzheimer's, my God, that, that can't just be genes. And they've even found that exercise for people who have dementia can control some of the, the manifestations of it. So um, there's a saying that, that when you walk, you're, you have your two legs are your doctors. It's, apparently it's true. Has anyone, oh, has anyone you ever, has, has anyone you interviewed ever told you, I love you, but I can't live like this anymore? Um, I think you mean in terms of be, living with, with a disease? You mean living with a disease? Um, no, but I was with some people last night, and we were talking about this, and uh, one of the men, his mother has Alzheimer's, and he said that she had told him uh, years earlier that if she ever, th they, they were visiting a friend who had Alzheimer's, and she said, if I ever get like that, put a gun to my head. You know, and of course he's not gonna, there's no way he's gonna put a gun to his head. Um, but in my research I found that people thought about those kinds of things. I mean, there was a, there was a club of seniors in Greenbelt, Maryland, who had made a, a, a suicide pact that if one of the spouse got Alzheimer's, they would both end their lives. Um, and if you, if any of you have seen the movie or read the book Still Alice, um, which is about a woman who develops Alzheimer's. You know, she had, when she developed the disease, she had put away pills um, because she said, if it ever gets so bad, but then by the time she got so bad, she couldn't even remember how to use the pills. So I think that Alzheimer's makes you think about these kinds of life and death. What is the meaning of life? How do you want to live? How do you want to die? Um, and they're deep questions that, um, and I think families need to talk about this. I had already, we'd already made a will and everything, but during the research for this book, I sat down with our grown children and talked about, you know, this is what we want, this is what we, we don't want, et cetera, et cetera. And these are important issues that families need to talk about. Thank you for the question.